Hi everyone. Thank you so much for being here today and watching this video. I'm Rebecca Cummings. I'm Interim Director of Digital Matters at the University of Utah and a librarian in the Marriott Library. Now, as a librarian, I not only want to make sure you have access to the best information out there, I also care very much that you know how to critically evaluate information that you come into contact with online. So today, we're going to talk about mis- and disinformation. We're going to talk about different types of misinformation, why there is such a prevalence of misinformation today, and we're going to hopefully gain some skills and internal filters to help you identify misinformation when you come into contact with it online. Now, I think a really important thing to note is that misinformation is not a new phenomenon. Sometimes we act as if we're living in some misinformation era since 2016, and that prior to that, there was this epistemically consistent past where most people had access to good information and almost everyone believed the same thing. But really, you only have to look back at like the last hundred years of human history to see so many cases where that's obviously not the truth. Now, for instance, think about the way that information circulated about Japanese internment camps in the 1940s such as this piece of propaganda here that we're looking at from Dr. Seuss. Think about the way that the civil rights movement was discussed in the 1950s and 1960s, or the suppression of information around the AIDS crisis in the 1980s, or the way that conspiracy theories circulated in the wake of 9-11. Ever since humans have been able to make truth claims about the world, we have been awash in misinformation, disinformation, hoaxes, conspiracy theories, rumors, and all the other things that pollute our information environment. Now, another misunderstanding I think around information integrity is that information lives in two buckets, that it's like there's good information and there's bad information. And in the good information, we find things like scholarly peer reviewed articles, um, you know, journalism from reputable journalists. And in the bad bucket, we have misinformation that's circulated by bad actors. Now, in reality, the quality of information sits on a spectrum. And it's our job to learn how to evaluate the information that we come into contact with, to find out more about the provenance of that information, thinking about where it came from, for example, and then to decide how we plan on using that information moving forward. I love this quote here on the screen from John Green. You may be familiar with John Green. He's the author of The Fault in Our Stars and a lot of other books and many, many hilarious YouTube videos. But he says here, the quality of our information directly shapes the quality of our decisions and the quality of our decisions shapes the quality of our shared experience as humans. Information integrity matters. Believing true things about the world matters, and I hope we can agree on that, because good information helps us make good decisions, which hopefully helps us to solve problems and navigate the world that we live in. Now, even though just a minute ago I said that in misinformation is nothing new, the reality is we are living in an era where misinformation is more prevalent than it's ever been in the past. And... I was thinking a little bit about all the different reasons why that's the case. And so I have six of them listed here. I'm sure there's more, but these are the ones that I could think of. The first is probably the most obvious. Ever since the advent of the internet in the 90s, information has never flowed more freely than it does today. Now, when we were, you know, when I was a kid and in every era prior, in order to broadly circulate information, you had to go through gatekeepers like publishers and editors but since the internet, everyone is a publisher of content. Um, everyone can share their ideas and beliefs and stories. And while there's a lot of benefits to the democratization of information like that, um, when information is that free and publishing is that easy, um, misinformation is pretty much inevitable. The second reason might not be something you think about as frequently, and that's that we currently have a more diverse, less regulated media landscape than we did in the past. And when my parents were kids, there were basically three TV stations they could watch, ABC, CBS, and NBC. And all three of those stations were governed by regulations um, called the Fairness Doctrine or the Equal Time Rule that basically meant information had to be, or news, had to be 
right down the middle, that they had to show um, all sides of an issue. Now, of course, there were biases when news was being reported at that time, but there was an attempt to make sure that news was reported um, in a neutral and objective manner and not in an inflammatory man manner. Now, since the 1980s, when the fairness doctrine was overturned, um, the information landscape looks completely different. Rather than just having three stations reporting out on kind of boring news, we have the rise of partisan news stations, the rise of partisan cable news, where people don't have to adhere to the fairness doctrine. And more often, they're reporting news in an inflammatory way that's meant to either entertain people or to enrage them or engage them in some, some other way. We've also seen the rise of the 24-hour a day news cycle where they're having to come up with more and more content just to fill the time. Another reason why we're seeing more information, and this one really hurts my heart, is the decline of local journalism. Since 2005, over 2,500 newspapers have gone out of business in the United States. And of course, that's because more and more people are getting their information from the internet. But what's happened in the wake of losing all those excellent journalists who are adhering to ethical you know, journalist, journalism uh, practices is that we have fewer journalists doing that good work, reporting on newsworthy stories, and more people going to more national, more partisan um, sources of their information. The fourth is one that I'm sure you're all familiar with, and that is the rise of social media. That's the way so many of us get our information nowadays. But social media, of course, is not serving you content that it thinks is true or good for you. The way that algorithms for social media work is to give you content that it thinks you're going to like. Things that speak to your confirmation biases, pushing us into further and further filter bubbles where we're not seeing what other people see that believe different things than we do. And of course, this was kind of humankind's first interactions with artificial intelligence, and it wasn't really... Um, really good for the maintenance of our civilization. It's had really big impacts on things like mental health, democracy, um, and culture. The fifth is the commodification of your attention. And this was a concept that was brilliantly explored in the documentary, The Social Dilemma, if you've seen that. But really what it is, is that almost anywhere you spend time on the internet, whether it be YouTube or social media, the people where you are spending that time is in the business of capturing and keeping your attention for clicks and scrolling so that they can get more profit. It's again, not set up in a way that's meant to deliver you good information or information that makes you an informed citizen capable of good choices, but just to keep you again, clicking and scrolling, um, your attention is what it wants. And of course, there's a whole body of research that shows that the things that tend to keep your attention um, are things that are more, um, well, more extreme or more radical or more um, inflammatory. There's actually, um, there was one MIT study that showed information that's untrue travels six times as fast as information that is true. So there's just one data point right there. Now, the last thing that I'm going to mention here is the rise of artificial intelligence. And 2023, as you know, has been a big year for AI and for the deployment of tools open to pretty much everyone. Um, I'm sure you've played with things like ChatGPT or Dolly or Stable Diffusion, but it's not hard to see that the rise of artificial intelligence tools, um, again, rolled out in a broad way, is going to have um, a really detrimental effect on misinformation on the open web. When content can, that can be created instantaneously that is tailored for a particular user and has the ability um, to engage, we're just going to see a lot more prevalence and effectiveness of misinformation on the web. Let's get some definitions set. So misinformation is unintentionally incorrect information. So think of this maybe as like the careless retweet, for example, when you see a story again that confirms what you think you already know about the world and you just go ahead and share it without doing any kind of fact checking or lateral reading. Disinformation, on the other hand, is intentionally false information designed to cause harm. So disinformation might be, um, for example, a politician who's spreading rumors about their political opponent that they know is, is not true 
or maybe they're spreading information that again, they know isn't true, but helps them achieve their political aims. Now, I think you heard a podcast that featured Claire Wardle um, from First Draft. She's a misinformation expert. And a lot of what we're gonna talk about on the next few slides is really drawn from what she calls information disorder. And it goes beyond just mis and disinformation. She also explains things like malinformation where true information is shared, but for bad purposes. So maybe someone who is doxing someone else by sharing their personal home address online, for example. And there are lots of different ways we can talk about this information disorder. Again, propaganda, lies, hoaxes. The important thing is that we used nuanced vocabulary around these terms instead of just resorting to unhelpful terms like fake news. So now we're going to dive into Claire Wordle's ontology. You probably heard a little bit about this, but I think it's useful just to unpack it a little bit more. And again, thinking in a more nuanced way about the kinds of misinformation that you might come into contact with online. So Claire sets up her ontology from the least harmful forms of misinformation to the most harmful forms of misinformation, starting with something you may not even think of as misinformation, and that's satire. Now, satire serves a really important political and social commentary, but where it can veer into misinformation is when it's screenshot and shared as if it was a true news story. Another kind of misinformation that may not seem very harmful is false connection or what's commonly referred to as clickbait. Now, we've all got sucked into clickbait because it knows what we want to click on. Um, people who engineer these like understand human psychology and what's going to keep us clicking, again, for profit. So for example, you see those bud, BuzzFeed quizzes that keep you clicking and clicking to see like the instant red flags in any relationship. Um, sometimes there's slideshows that keep you going through 50 different slides and it never quite connects you to the information you thought you were looking for. And I, I want to note on this slide that even reputable sources like the Salt Lake Tribune, whom I love and I subscribe to, even they sometimes have headlines that I would regard as clickbait. If you look at the example on the slide here, dead people voting, hacked machines, rogue clerks, is there any truth to this mail-in ballot myth? Well, if you click on that headline, what the article essentially says is, no, there's no truth to that mail-in ballot myth. But the Salt Lake Tribune, like all the places you visit on the internet, are in the business of driving traffic to their websites for advertisements or to, to keep people interested in their content. So again, it's not in the bucket of all good or all bad, the Tribune is a reputable site that sometimes engages in clickbait headlines, like everybody else does. A third kind of misinformation is misleading content. This is a very common form of misinformation, and it's one that's a little hard to define because it's not untrue necessarily, but there's often this layer of framing or narrative on top of it um, that you have to be more familiar with the content to be able to identify. So take this slide, for example. This was an infographic that was broadly shared in the wake of the 2016 election. It's representing all the counties in the country that voted Republican. And what it's meant to convey is like, look at this, the whole country voted Republican, everybody voted Republican. But the underlying fallacy, of course, is that land doesn't vote, land doesn't elect our presidents. And there are a lot more people that live in the blue areas of the map than the red areas of the map, making the election much closer than this infographic would um, make you believe. So a fourth kind of misinformation is false context. And again, a really common form of misinformation because it has, um, because it relies upon true content. So it's when genuine content is shared with false contextual information that's meant to mislead. So looking at our slide here, here is an image that was shared by Turning Point USA, a conservative group um, that has millions of followers on Facebook. They posted this picture of empty grocery store shelves that said, Everyone understands the importance of free markets, eventually. Hashtag socialism sucks. But in reality, the empty supermarket shelves that we're looking at here have nothing to do with socialism or the lack of a free market. This photo was taken in 2011 after a major earthquake in Japan, and it's something that could be easily fact-checked if you just did a simple reverse Google image search. Now, of course, the creator of this content might say, well, this was just satirical. But you can see how someone sees this and doesn't take it as satirical, but takes it as true information that's being shared. 
Now, going into more nefarious kinds of misinformation, we get to number five, imposter content. And that's when genuinely trustworthy sources are impersonated. Now, this is a really powerful tool because as we're going to talk about in the back half of this video, one of the things we rely upon to figure out what is um, high quality information is that it comes from an authoritative trusted source. But imposter content is often when um, someone either hacks into maybe a true account like Associated Press or the New York Times, or more likely that they just um, impersonate the content. So here's a good example here that happened uh, in the wake of a policy change at Twitter that I'm sure many of you are familiar with. Now, prior to um, a few months ago, if we saw a blue check mark, we know that it was a verified source from Twitter. Well, when Twitter changed their policy and made um, the Twitter blue policy where you could purchase a check mark for eight dollars, um, someone impersonated the pharmaceutical company Eli Lilly and Company and said, you know, they had a, a, a believable handle, a believable name, used the logo, got your blue check, and they said, "We are excited to announce insulin is free now." Now, of course, Twitter went crazy thinking that um, it got shared and liked and retweeted. And unfortunately, a lot of people believe that this was a true tweet, um, especially if it may have affected their lives. But very quickly, the real Eli Lilly came out and said, this was an imposter account. This is not us. Uh, insulin is not free now. And you can just see that even though um, it was meant to be a joke and maybe meant to uh, poke fun a little bit at both pharmaceutical companies and Twitter, there's real damage when people might have believed this to be real information that ended up just being imposter content. Now, the fifth kind of misinformation is digitally manipulated content. So when they use true images, but then digitally manipulate them in the past through things like Photoshop, now through with things like artificial intelligence to create um, completely different fake videos, images, audio recordings, now, historically, we've talked historically over the last few years, we've looked at things like the Tom Cruise deep fakes or the Obama deep fake, which was created with considerable amounts of tech technical expertise and even in, you know, impersonators, um, you know, backing up the content. But now with all these really remarkable tools in AI, it's getting easier and easier for anyone to create this digitally manipulated content. And so this is an area where we're going to see a lot more in the coming years. So the seventh kind of misinformation is truly fabricated content. And this is hoaxes that have no basis whatsoever in reality. An example of that, like you see on the slide, is the Pizzagate hoax, uh, a story circulated on Twitter saying that there was a child sex ring being run in the basement of Comet Pizzeria in Washington, D.C. Someone actually believed that information and went to the pizzeria with a gun and, and fired shots thinking that he was saving children in the basement. Um, again, a great example of how misinformation can cause real damage in the real world. Now, there's a new kind of misinformation that we're seeing pop up more and more frequently um, on the internet, and that is hallucinations that are created by AI. Um, now, when I was thinking about what kind of misinformation this was, it didn't seem to fit neatly into any bucket. Hallucinations are confident responses given to us by AI that are untrue and they don't seem to be justified by their training data. And we don't really know why AI does, does these things because it's a little bit of a black box on the inside. So just for example, recently I asked ChatGPT where I should submit a paper based on an abstract that I provided it. Uh, ChatGPT gave me a really convincing title, gave me a description of the journal and a link to the website. And I was like, oh, well, this sounds great. But then underneath that, it actually said, please note that this, uh, please note that this suggested journal and website are fictional and provided for illustrative purposes. Now, this was a time where ChatGPT caught its hallucination, but there are plenty of times where it doesn't. And while sometimes it may not matter so much, and then you just reprompt it with something that gives you better information, it's also not hard to imagine a scenario, maybe when you're looking for the dosage of children's Tylenol, for example, where it could be really harmful if it gave you misinformation that you believed without fact checking. So now that we are seeing so much misinformation, the rise of AI, we probably will see in the coming year some kind of technological intervention, something built into the architecture of the internet, for example, that will let us know like the probability that something was created with artificial intelligence. Um, we may also see government regulations that dictate, you know, what people can and can't do with digitally manipulated information. 
but we haven't seen those things yet. And so at this point, the best bulwark you can have against misinformation is really honing your own detection skills within yourself when it comes to misinformation, honing your own skepticism and having a toolkit for how, how you fact check things when you come into contact with it on the internet. Now, the good news is that evaluating information is a skill, and research shows it's a skill that can be developed relatively rapidly when you take on some of the things that fact checkers do, and you slow down your belief formation. So we're going to talk about that now. Now, the framework that we're going to use when thinking about um, critically evaluating the information you come up, you come into contact with online to make sure you don't believe misinformation are what's referred to as the five R's of information literacy recognizing triggers, retracing the outrage, reflecting on our on your own biases, resisting the urge to be first, and revisiting common sense. So the first one, recognizing triggers, is really a combination of using your critical thinking and your critical feeling skills. When you come into contact with information on the web, you have to check in with yourself and say, how is this content making me feel? Is it making me feel angry for some reason? Is it triggering me in some way? Does it seem relatively neutral? And then thinking about who on the internet might want me to feel this way. Why is this information being shared? Because of course, information is shared for a variety of reasons. It might be shared by a journalist who's looking to inform. It might be looking shared by a politician who's looking to persuade. It might be shared by someone who's just simply trying to turn a profit and doesn't care if you believe true things or not. Um, I sh I'm sharing these motivations here on the screen from Claire Wardle, but just thinking again. So what type of information is being shared? How is it making me feel? And who might want me to feel this way? And developing those internal filters within yourself, considering the motivations for why people might want to share it. And then once you've done that work, um, the second thing that you're going to do is to retrace the outrage through lateral reading. Now, of course, the emotion you feel is not always going to be outrage, but retracing the feelings in yourself and thinking again, who might want me to feel that way? And where can I learn more about them? So the important skill that's meant to be utilized here is the skill of lateral reading. Now, historically, when we learned how to read things, you know, we read through vertical reading. We read left to right, top to bottom to try to figure out if it was good information or not, trying to sort of ascertain whether or not it's accurate and who created it and is it current. But in the internet age, one of the best resources we have at our disposal is that we can go elsewhere to find additional information. So when you come into contact with a news story online, for example, open up another tab and figure out who is the person who's writing this, what are their credentials? Um, we can find out very quickly what is the source's authority? What is the author's professional background? What is the process that that person used to produce that information? While we know that nothing is ever completely neutral or objective, some journalists engage in open-minded inquiry and use particular um, journalistic standards to check their biases, very similar to how scientists use the scientific method to root out their biases. Um, some journalists are better at using methods for, for interviewing and investigation, or they have systems in place to catch it when they make mistakes, like systems of retraction. Um, so the bottom line here is that we, in order to learn more about a story, we have to leave the website to actually understand the website or story or whatever. Now, the third thing that we can do to be critical consumers of information is to reflect on our own biases. We all have biases. We have biases like confirmation bias, where you look for information that you already agree with and you tend to go in that direction. We have negativity bias. For example, if 10 people tell you something nice about yourself and one person says something mean, we tend to think about the negative thing. These biases affect our ability to evaluate information in an objective way. Now, in order to counter those biases in your information consumption, it's really important to read from a variety of sources. Don't get everything you read from one place. Try to look at different, especially controversial issues from a variety of perspectives. Try to follow people on social media that maybe you disagree with, but who still seem to be acting in good faith so you get a better sense of an issue. You may not change your mind about the issue, and that's fine, especially if you've been trying to take in different kinds of information, but at least you'll be a better informed person looking at something from all sides. 
Now, there are some great tools for doing this on the internet. All Sides is a popular tool that has a media bias chart, for example. Now, you may not agree where every individual item sits on the media bias chart, but it kind of shows you where your information diet is coming from. And might, you know, I might encourage you to check sources from other places as well. A great resource we have in the Marriott Library is in, it's on our library website in the databases called CQ Researcher. And that is a great way to learn about um, topics that are of interest, topics that might be considered controversial. You could go in and read these in-depth reports that are very readable about climate change, the death penalty, healthcare policy, the immigration crisis, inflation. It'll give you chronologies of important moments in time. It will give the, the steel man version of both arguments around that issue instead of the straw man version. And so that is a wonderful resource available to you through the Marriott Library. Now, while you're checking your bias, it's also important to check your privilege. Why do you have access to incredible databases like CQ Researcher? Because you're a student at the University of Utah and your tuition dollars help pay for these high quality sources of information. Now, unfortunately, a lot of high quality information lives behind paywalls. Things like peer reviewed research often live behind paywalls or high quality, high quality journalism like the New York Times or the Washington Post which you also have access to through the Marriott Library. And I just, I have this slide here just to make you aware if, if sometimes rather than labeling someone as stupid, for example, because they believe misinformation, just recognize that they may not have information to all the same information that you do. Okay, the fourth thing that we can do when we're trying to be, again, critical consumers of information is to resist the urge to be first to slow down. Be thoughtful when you're consuming and circulating information. You don't have to be first. The truth is sometimes the facts of a news story, for example, take time to come to light. So to whatever extent you can, slow down your opinion and belief formation. Allow more time for a complete story to emerge. Check your facts. Build a case form an argument. And while you're at it, exercise those lateral reading skills, checking places like fact checking sites, like Snopes or PolitiFact, or yes, Wikipedia. Um, and then when you get new information, try to stay nimble and change the story you've been telling yourself around that particular piece of information. And then the last thing I'm going to encourage you to do is just to revisit common sense. As the saying often goes, if it's too incredible or outrageous to be true, it probably is. Try to, when you come into contact with something on the internet, just use your common sense. So if this, this photograph, for example, was broadly shared in 2020. The caption of this photo said that it was in Wuhan, China. But if you look closely at the image, you can see that, yes, there are signs in Chinese, but there's also one-way street signs in English. So it's very likely that this image was not taken in Wuhan, China, and that more likely it was taken in a Chinatown in America. And if you look closer at the image, you can even see there's a banner on there that says it's for a hair salon and it's called Hair Plus. So either a quick reverse Google image search or just a Google search of Hair Plus Chinatown will tell you that this photo actually was from New York City, not from Wuhan, China. And if you wanted to even dig deeper into this photograph, if you want to be like a real digital detective, you could even look up Hair Plus New York City, find out what street this is on, and go actually look on Google Maps and look around. There are so many amazing digital or so many amazing tools at our disposal to learn more about images and text and news stories. And by slowing down, employing lateral reading, using those critical thinking and feeling skills, you are so much less subject to falling prey to mis- and disinformation. Okay, I would be remiss if I didn't give a shout out to the Marriott Library website. Um, if you want to reduce your cognitive load and go to where you're going to find extremely high quality information that helps you um, do your scholarly work and just learn more about anything, I do encourage you to go to lib.utah.edu. Okay. So just for some final thoughts and some practical advice here, keep in mind, information lives on a spectrum. It's not all good or all bad. Most of it actually sits in the middle. Cultivate those critical thinking and feeling skills so that you, you can look within yourself to say, okay, I'm feeling this way about this story. Who might want me to feel this way? And then 
going out and figuring out more about the person who authored or shared that content. Now, in order to check your own biases, read from a variety of sources and follow accounts that might have different points of view than you do, but hopefully are acting in good faith. Be suspicious of information that confirms your pre-existing worldview. And if you want artificial intelligence to know less about you, go ahead and turn off that data tracking. I would say the most important thing on here is that you need from time to time to take a break from the internet, take a deep breath and talk to actual people. And if you can, befriend a librarian. We love connecting you with high quality information. Now, that's all I have for you today. Here's my contact information if you'd like to get a hold of me. Thank you so much for your time and attention, and I hope you have a great semester. Bye.